that uh, telling us your name, uh, professional position, and your relationship with the Chitinga community. Yes, my name is Love Mo Maduku. I'm professionally a lawyer. I'm also a professor of law at the University of Zimbabwe. Uh, my relationship with the people of Chipinge is that I come from Chipinge, so I'm a Chipinge person myself and relate with uh, the people of Chipinge in my capacity as one of them and then more importantly trying to help them legally. Okay. Can we, you, you say that you have been trying to help the people legally. Maybe you can tell us the nature of their land uh, struggles. Uh, I would say that the m main nature of the land struggle uh, is one of displacement mm -hmm. from the areas where they are resident and doing their communal land activities. Historically, most people in Zipinge have been resident where they are uh, on the basis of the ties they have to the land and the activities that they have been carrying out on, that, on those pieces of land. Uh, I know that uh, from the colonial times, many people who are where they are were there before independence. They were there much earlier than that. Uh, we're talking of periods going, I'm sure, perhaps 500 years or so, people were in those areas. And then after independence, they remained there and were enjoying what we now call communal land rights, meaning that uh, they have a right to occupy the piece of land uh, that they have and then they have a right also to do the activities uh, on those pieces of land. But other people have come in who have an interest in utilizing that land for different purposes and are the ones that are displacing these people. Okay. But why then would um, a post-colonial state that prides itself in decoloniality, uh, like the Zimbabwean state, go on to dig these colonial master plans that are rooted in uh, authoritarian high modernism of the colonial world? Uh, I think that is a very good question. That question must be answered in the light of uh, the answers we ought to give to the nature of the post-colonial state. I is it a state that is focused on transformation? Uh, real transformation, fundamental transformation? Or is it a state that uh, believes in merely perpetuating, being a really servant of uh, the bigger political and economic uh, framework that dominates the world generally? I think in our case, in the case of many African countries, the post-colonial states have not been transformation states. They would be happier uh, preserving what is there, managing it to their best ability. But in this case, they are simply more interested in protecting the interests of those that wish to take up this land. And I think they have more rights according to the post-colonial system we have here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then why, why, do, why, why does it seem so easy for these uh, private companies with business interests that you have been talking about uh, in collusion with the state to just uh, dispossess uh, the, the black communities who are living under customary uh, tenure systems. Is it uh, necessarily a legal problem, a political problem, a policy, the tenure systems, or just weak social movements? I think it is a question of almost all the things that you are mentioning, but I'll start from the legal one. The legal one is quite obvious in the sense that uh, the communal land rights that uh, we inherited uh, at the time of independence, and which we still perpetuate, because I said we have not transformed them, they do not give specific legal rights of ownership or legal rights of um, occupation that can resist someone who wants to interfere. For example, our law says that the communal land vests in the president, which means that it vests in the state. That means that the state can always uh, play around with that land. It is different from any other form of land tenure where you have uh, private ownership. Uh, the state cannot come and uh, take away my land here in, in, in an urban area. In Arari, for example, I own a piece of property 
I am sure that no one would even try to take it because the law protects it. So I would say that the legal problem is lack of adequate legal protection of criminal land rights. And that uh, is why it is easy, because all what it means is that the state claims it is the owner. So the private uh, interested parties or the private businesses, they technically at law go to the owner of the land. And I would wish that I occupy that and use it for this. And according to the law, the owner of the land has all rights uh, to do anything that they please with their land, including evicting people uh, that they are owning there. That's it. So it's a weakness of that uh, legal environment. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, uh, Professor, you are saying that uh, private ownership it tends to be more secure. But we witnessed here in Zimbabwe in year 2000, you know, what happened to the white farmers who had what I think can be termed as the strongest titles in terms of ownership of land. Yes, I mean, that's, that is correct that uh, you, you we have had an experience where even private land ownership was um, reduced in terms of its protection mechanisms. But what happened in that case is that uh, the government here had to actually change the constitution to make provision for uh, interfering with uh, private property to that extent. And then I think with the land, then there's also the historical question that had to be addressed. You could have that. But uh, you know that recently, even in South Africa, they have had, it has become impossible also for them to acquire land or take land, private land, without compensation. I mean, the attempts to change the constitution in South Africa failed. Uh, here it was easy to do that. So you are correct that even private land ownership can be interfered with. But that is very limited in very exceptional situations like what happened in Zimbabwe. Perhaps <coughs> because of that, uh, the government here or the state here has extended that lack of respect for property rights to the communal land area, which is they ought to protect the rights. Uh, communal land rights are proper rights, like private property rights. They are just different levels or different degrees of property rights. And once you don't respect what can be regarded as the greatest protection, for historical reasons, of course, and it's justifiably so, to get some land taken away from the former colonial masters, I think that it is rather too much for the state to have taken that further into the communal land area. No, yeah, thanks. Uh, then, uh, do you think what's happening in other countries uh, like Mozambique, uh, Zambia, where we are doing a similar study, it can work in Zimbabwe? And maybe let me explain what's happening there first. Because of this massive dispossession of people living on customer tenure, um, civil society, governments, international NGOs, they've they come together with what they call flanking me mechanism. That is, let us survey communal rents, let us uh, register them. Uh, uh, do you think that can be a solution in Zimbabwe to document customers yeah. and rights that way? Yes, I think that um, from the examples you are giving, I'm happy for that uh, example. Yes, it should be able to work in Zimbabwe. What we have seen in um, these areas uh, that we're discussing in Ping and so forth actually demonstrates the importance of that. I think this period of uh, or this process of saying that uh, it's communal land and that the government of the day still has rights, which they call the state and so forth, can do what you're saying. It's a very serious danger. There is need to protect every person's entitlement to land. And that entitlement is historical, it's actually God-given. No one put these people in the first place. All the state itself came into being after these people were already in place. I think that in the African setting, you created a Zimbabwe or a South Africa or a Mozambique or a Zambia out of people who were already there. Uh, most uh, of our communities, they predate the existence of these states. So they have more rights than uh, the states themselves. I mean, if you bring out a state in 1891 or 1890 or 1860, when people are already there, then you say you came out of them a, a, a state that you call, you know, a Rhodesia or you call what? And then you start taking away the rights of those people. I think that's not fair.
I, I, I think that uh, Professor Mandua Mbarukuni once uh, wrote a report to the government of Zimbabwe in the 1980s and he was proposing that uh, you know, communal land must be registered in a family trust. Do you have any view on that, rather than in an individual? Well, I'm sure they had done that, the Mandiwamba Rukuni Commission. Uh, it's well known for it. I think they did a lot of thorough study or thorough research. Um, one would uh, recommend that. I, I think the basis of our African settings they deal with these things, that communal land historically was owned by communities and then obviously families. So you have a family plot, a family place, which is how people live in rural areas. Uh, they will say this area is for this family, this area is for that family. And then if they are registered in family trust or some other mechanism that shows that it is land held in trust by families for the generation that will come, it might make better sense than if it is the individuals. Individuals may then tend to sell uh, that land or alienate it in a way that might disadvantage other members of the family. And that could be problematic. I mean, instead of these big companies approaching the state, they might approach <coughs> individuals, and you can also get a chaotic uh, outcome there. And wha wha what do you think uh, should be the role of, of traditional leaders in administering uh, customer land? Yes, I, I think that the role of traditional leaders it's not to, must not necessarily be to allocate or redistribute communal land. Mm -hmm. It must be to preserve the land holding processes. I think they should be able to know which family owns which places. And then to ensure that those families utilize the land equitably within the family setting. Let me give an example of a family that owns, uh, that is given a portion of communal area for of that family is somewhat disadvantaged because the family is not distributing or allocating its portions to them. And they should be able to go to a traditional leader for that. But they should not be given the power to take land from one family to the other. Uh, or etc. That should be very difficult. And then you could have areas of where new people are coming in uh, into areas and they are admitted to be part of uh, a setting then their uh, traditional leaders can uh, try and find land for them which can be found from, I mean there are so many families that either completely get deceased to themselves uh, and then there's no descendant from a particular family. Those are the kind of uh, isolated areas where the traditional leaders could allocate their land, that part of the land to newcomers if they are in. Uh. And then this, uh, that, that is very clear, but I want to go back to an issue you raised that what you are seeing is displacement. Can you say that uh, this is development induced uh, a displacement? Uh, no, not at all. It's not, it's not development induced uh, displacement. Very clearly in the sense that the, it is private individuals who are coming into areas that they select for their own uh, private advancement. But they find it inconvenient that that land is actually occupied by others. So then those others must get out. Let's, let's say you want to do um, some development, you want to put some academia, nurse, whatever the, the, you want to get involved in that. Like what you get in um, the upper par part of shipping. And then because you want to, to plan those things and to get involved in that business, you get those people out instead of organizing those people to use that land for that purpose. Or you are in the Chisumbanje area, you want to uh, grow you know, sugar cane, blah, 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 and so forth. You want to be involved in some ethanol business. You admire the land of those people. Instead of ensuring that these people are involved in that kind of production, then you say the company must do it and that these people must be condemned to poverty. So even you do what they call, I think it's the economists, they might use that, I don't know what they, uh, they might describe it, but there is an, uh, they call it a cost-benefit analysis, that's one way of doing it. So you look at the, in this, in this case, the cost, 
the amount of poverty you create out of displacement mm -hmm. completely outweighs whatever you call development from the input because this is a if you get the what is happening in the ethanol situation in the Chisumbanje area or whatever so you get the big green fuel company or Magdom or whoever is engaged they make lots of money perhaps that's what you mean and they even uh, secure you know this blending rice where they sell them but go around and see what the people there are doing they are not even able now to grow food for their own sustenance, their own subsistence. They, well, that can be development. If someone who was able to produce food for themselves yesterday is unable to do so today, that is clearly contrary. So you, you are talking about uh, the individuals with, with business interests. But we have also observed uh, from our study that there is actually the local state also displacing people. Would you differentiate those two kinds of displacement in terms of impact and relating that to development? Because the local state, I guess, that is for urban development, and that's what is needed to realize Vision 2030 for the country. Uh, I, I would not separate those. Uh, I think the first one to do with uh, private interests Clearly, I have said it's not development to the extent that it impoverishes the majority. Mm -hmm. Then the one that is of the local state, that is uh, a very unfortunate sort of um, approach, uh, which is where you get a local entity that simply wants to make money uh, out of uh, the land in its uh, communities. It's actually this thing that uh, a local authority must be able to make money in this idea get let's say you want to get more rates, get more yeah, taxes coming in <coughs> and then just to fund your budget. Uh, it's completely nonsense. Uh, mm -hmm. It is, um, I, I have no good way to explain that. But that is the kind of thing that should not even be tolerated. The argument by the local state doesn't simply make sense. Uh, when it, you compare it to the analysis I've said, you cannot displace these people, reduce them to extreme poverty so that the local authority is able to, to put up an establishment where it will be able to collect taxes. Because that's, I think that's what they're going to, to mm -hmm. be wanting to do. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you, you are not uh, differentiating uh, between, between those two. And... Uh, in terms of uh, the widespread nature of this problem, because it's not only happening in Chipinga, I think it's now happening in many parts of Zimbabwe. Do you think this can become a political or an electoral issue? Yes, I think that um, it can become an, a, a political, it is both an, a political and electoral issue. It is a um, a political issue in the sense that the political party that is in government, including the government itself, I think they are not taking into account what is at stake, which is the vested interest of the people there. It's politically unacceptable to allow persons to be displaced or persons to be relocated in the way we are hearing them do it completely politically unacceptable because it creates more problems than it tries to solve. I think they would have seen in some parts, I think in the Marshall Island East, where um, government had to reverse a decision where they had given a license to a Chinese investor to occupy some positions there. And the outcry was uh, quite uh, overwhelming and they had to give in to which is a political decision, that you can't do that, certain things. I mean, you have to develop within a community, but without uh, causing so much uh, political pain that is happening. Then electorally, it should make sense for uh, the voters in those places not to vote for, I think, the political party behind the government of the day that is allowing those things to happen. I think that should be, but this will depend on how the voters themselves get to link the government to the problems. We still have a situation where I think some voters may not be able to draw the link, or some voters, they are overwhelmed by the dominance of their political parties. 
So, for example, ZANU PF has the government that is there today. ZANU PF has the president who is there today. My experience that, in respect of what is happening in Jipenge, the government has not listened to anything there. It's very clear there. But uh, you might still see the people in those areas uh, calling themselves ZANU PF supporters and all the way still wanting the president uh, to remain in office and that they will vote for the president to remain in office without linking the president to the failure by him uh, and or the failure by his government to address that that point. I think if there is enough political work around that, voters would show it uh, in future elections. Okay, and, and uh, as, a, as a professor of law, do you think the Zimbabwean government is doing enough to protect women's property rights in, in general, but also land rights in, uh, in particular? And what, what can you refer to as the major strength and uh, weaknesses in there? Well, uh, I, I would say overall they are not doing enough. They are doing some work. Yes, in, in the only work that the government of Zimbabwe is doing in that regard would be, I think, speaking out and saying that uh, it's important to advance rights of women, for example, uh, that it is important to have gender equality, those things they say. But in terms of practicalities on the ground, I think they are not doing enough. I want to give an indication here that the government itself has a very clear, uh, has a clear misunderstanding, which comes out from it, of what do you mean by gender equality, what do you mean by women's rights. Let's just go back to the displacement themselves. The majority of the people in all these uh, communal areas, in all these places, are women. That is the first thing. And then secondly, the burden of... Uh, looking after families is mostly on women. And in my experience in getting to discuss with all these people, women have been very clear in articulating the problems that they are facing uh, and so forth. So if you want to refer to a program where there is oppression of women, it is that whole program on displacement. Whenever you displace anyone, the burden is on women more than it on any other person. And so that's where I'm saying they're not doing enough. Any government that is clearly sensitive to the rights of, we would not allow that sort of suffering. I don't know whether there, is, there are still people out there who do not understand uh, women's rights or to the extent of not knowing that these are not separable from any other uh, key issues. You cannot have any issue of uh, development which leads to poverty, which is a, not an issue of uh, undermining the rights of women. That's my experience. Mm -hmm. Whenever you create poverty, you are actually making women poorer. When, whatever you do in that regard, I mean, that's what we have, even when we had the time of talking about violence, once you put violence as a weapon, those which will suffer would be, and so forth, yeah. yeah. And in terms of you representing uh, this communities, uh, women and men. And well, what what major, in, are there any major international principles of law you have been using or are you just relying so much on the constitution of Zimbabwe and the local statutes? Well, we have been using mainly uh, principles of international law. Some of them are put in the law of Zimbabwe in the constitution. But I would say that uh, the basic motivation of our law is really an international principle, which is, you know, a right, first, a right to a home is an international principle that is respected everywhere, which is a clear principle. And then secondly, it's you know, a right to be able to earn a living, to, to, so you have a home and then you are able to earn a living. And these are uh, principles that are enshrined in the United Nations uh, Declaration of Human Rights and taken up by uh, the International Covenant on Civil, uh, Social and Political Rights and so forth. And even the Covenant on Social and Economic Rights, they will deal with those. So we then use them to interpret the Zimbabwean constitution in the light of international standards. 
and now more fundamentally we are trying to give a legal basis to communal land rights as an independent right in itself. That is well, so I think the land there is one change that is required. I think the <coughs> Communal Lands Act must be changed mm. to reflect the fact uh, that uh, putting land in the hands of the president does not give the president the right to then utilize that land without regard to the people who are there or to reallocate that land to anyone. Mm. It is simply, the president is simply an, a legal fiction of the person who owns, just a legal fiction. But the land is actually owned by uh, the person that. The president is like a trust. When property is registered in the name of a trust, the trust does does exist as a legal fiction. It doesn't exist even a company. To say that there's a company called so it does not exist. Mm. We can't touch it. Mm. It exists as a legal fiction. But there are always individuals behind uh, those. So what the president or the state here misunderstands this. When we say that communal land vests in the government, it doesn't give the government substantive rights uh, to utilize that land in a way different. It simply gives the government the legal figurehead of saying, if we say, who owns this? It's a, it's a real and empty shell. I think that the um, British, when they created some law that is very well known around the world, <coughs> the law of equity, and then when they created the trust, the concept mm. of a trust, you hold the property in trust, it is not yours. On paper, you are the owner. So the board of trustees, they are made to run a uh, property for the benefit of beneficiaries. Mm. So I would want the Communal Land Act to be changed so that the beneficiaries are given substantive rights in the law. And then the powers of the owner who is owning in, or as a matter of trust are defined, and that's it. In the rest, I think it's implementation. Okay. And, yeah. but, but if we read the, the Communal Land Rights Act together with the national constitution, is there a provision for these communities to say yes or no to the kind of development projects that are proposed by either the state or private businesses? Is there a scope? I think the scope is very limited within the Constitution mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that there is not a specific provision <coughs> that grants some land rights to individuals. And you can strain and get some provisions in the Constitution that can be utilized for them, for that. And I think most people that have tried to use the Constitution directly in that regard, they will take uh, provisions that deal with the right to equal treatment, the right to the protection of the law, uh, the right to be able to engage in economic activity of one's choice, and so forth. But when you come to the land um, provisions on land in the Constitution, that is Section 71 and Section 72, communal land is actually excluded from the land that the Constitution regards as land in Section 71 and Section 72. So that's, that somewhat limits uh, the rights. So it might involve, if there is going to be any need, some constitutional amendment. Uh, if one wants to put it on a firm basis, a very firm basis. And there is need for those. Well, before, it never used to be like what we are saying. I think under the current government, there is a misunderstanding of what is meant by development. They think that getting these private business people and these big companies, uh, high up the high sounding you know, pieces of development, that is development. The current government is lo not looking at um, the ultimate impact on the ordinary people in those areas that are affected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I can state to deny communities the explicit right to say no or yes to development projects. The, if you look at Mozambique, it's not explicit. If you look at Zambia, they got their land policy just towards the election, but they also deleted this right to say yes or no. The South African government 
is being forced by the judiciary, not the executive arm. Why, why do you think there's this convergence to deny the people the, the right to, to say no explicitly or yes in the constitution, given that these are supposed to be democratic constitutional government? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. I, I have a very clear answer to that. I think it's a colonial mentality. The kind of governments we have uh, in Africa, most of them now, they still haven't come out of that. They are not, I said at the beginning of the interview that um, these are not transformative states. These are people that still have a colonial angle. It is only in Africa, in fact, mainly Africa, where you get that outright disrespect for the people, which is what we know with what colonialism did from the 1890s. It did one thing which is so terrible and which has continued despite independence. Get into a place, don't care about what the inhabitants of that place do. Just pursue your interests, don't ask them. That's what colonialism did. You just come and impose yourself and then you start mining, you start getting land, you start displacing people and so forth. So when you get independence, you still get people who think that governance <coughs> somewhat at some point and that, that that's a very uh, colonial thing you don't always need to consult but if you go to many of the developed states i don't think that you will see an american government disrespecting its people to that extent or you would see some other i can mention the kind of developed states and so on. i think this idea of disrespecting people it's a colonial mentality which came out and until Africa gets governments that really ap appreciate that we are all equal, all our persons are. And I will not be surprised even in the young generation we have, those who are younger than me, who still do not respect people. Uh, and I see them, I meet them in university, yeah, the students, much younger, I'm not saying much younger because I'm, I, when I'm referring to much younger people, I own the lecture stuff. But let's say you invoke a discussion in a, in, a, in a lecture with students who are 20, 21, and so forth. You'll be shocked what they think. They, you give them a position as the student leader here. The next thing, they run away with the program without consulting any of the students. They can even come to you and say, hey, Professor, ah, we think that that extra lecture you were proposing, we have it at three. If you don't ask them, whether they've consulted with others, the chances are that this is a time that is being set for this, the class rep, and that's what he wants, he wants it at three. Then the moment you say, okay, go and form the class, you can put it, they now have what they call WhatsApp groups. Mm -hmm. Then the other students who are more courageous will straight get to your inbox and say, Professor, but we can't have a lecture at three. <laughs> and I thought that the class rep has discussed this thing. You, you you get it everywhere. It's a very difficult mentality. And I'm answering your question, why is it there is what you are calling a convergence? It's a colonial mentality. Africa still has to come out of that and it's going to be our biggest struggle here. Once you are in government and you have power, first and foremost, respect the people. So, and then it's worsened by the fact that uh, in many of the processes, most of the African leaders, they get into power through an election where they don't respect the people. So the people themselves are partly to blame. They vote without applying their minds to it. Now, if you are a leader who gets into government, mm -hmm. when you just find it cheap to get a vote, which is what we find here. I mean, so if you get the examples, they want elections every day, uh, despite their performance and so on. When, but when it comes to elections, they're always confident. You ask, why is that? Part of the reason why is that, is that the voter is such that it makes it very easy for this. So even when you get uh, other groups that are not necessarily in government, when they talk about an election, it's based on a disrespect uh, for uh, the voting population. I have one MP who wants to get back into office, I think they were very cold. They were not doing anything for about 10 years. Then they go to the cold. Now, uh, and it's known in the constituents that uh, they were doing nothing for 10 years. But uh, they are likely to be re-elected if an opportunity arises. And now now goes back, he attends one or two funerals there. And you get to the voters, the voters still think that, uh, you know, we're waiting for our MP when the term, what is that? You <laughs> vote for this person, 
due to circumstances without you knowing, he was chucked out of parliament. Mm. Is this an opportunity to get someone who is better? I mean, I, I can just give you, I'm just contributing to that debate. Why? I think that from the issue you have raised uh, of uh, companies that are getting lent, what you're saying, lent rush and so it actually confirms my difficulty which I put across, which is a colonial mentality. So it's a neo-colonial framework. We, so even people in Western societies who would want land, and they know that uh, you cannot just displace a person who knows what they are doing, who are entitled where they are. But where else can you have that with the support of the governments? I think you can have it in Africa, where you have a very ready uh, a partner in people you can uh, agree to go and um, completely displace your own people, do not respect your own people. So it's because they know the politics we are used to. It's based on non-respect for people. I mean, look at how sometimes people in rural areas are viewed in our political makeup. They are not regarded as people who would think properly uh, and so on. So you can cheat them politically. Uh, sometimes you use them politically and so on. I think we have a lot of work to do in that regard. Okay. And there are, there are to, to extend, there are three dominant debates at the moment at the United Nations level and at the African Union level about uh, dealing with this land-based investments. I think the first one is that uh, let's support uh, the people, indigenous people who are living on that land. And we support them to grow. Uh, we don't necessarily need this large capital moving into these places, there's a way to support them when they are there. Uh, that is mostly coming from the United Nations Rapporteur and some of the African Union. The second debate is that more, there's a chance to coexist, where you create a win-win-win situation, a win for the state, which wants taxes, win for the people, and win for the for, for private capital. Then the third one is that no less of development has happened uh, in Europe, whereby you have a transition from this kind of informal, small scale economic activity into large scale based big investments where people who are living there then become the workers. Out of these three, what would be your contribution? I think because I missed these are raging debates at the Africa Union. Okay, I didn't get the first one. The first one is that let's support the people who are there. You don't need, uh, you don't necessarily need this big private capital moving on to this marginal lands. The people who are there can be able to steer development. Then the second is... Uh, I think the others I've got. Yeah. That's why I asked for the first because the other two didn't make sense. So I didn't thought I missed something then. Okay. So obviously I go for the first one, which I... I mean, that's... I mean, no one is, I think let's go back to principles of what is a moral right and what is not. There are certain things, who has that moral superiority to be able to then sit around and say, look, um, I think development which is good is that let's do it this way, we remove. I think the only morally acceptable way of doing things would be to go to the people and you support them there. Any development must work. And it's possible, any development theory must be able to survive with the people in place. And that the development must be like that. Otherwise you can end up relocating people from Africa to Asia or I, mean, I think if colonialism had not been stopped, we would have had a situation like that. Uh, but somewhat people fought it. But I mean, the way those things where you have people getting from one area to the next, I think the better debate in the African Union is the first point that Let's work with that. Even those private companies, whatever they want to do must be done within uh, the thing. Let's say you are a big company and you want to support sugarcane production by the communities there. And then you have a contract with them as to what you get out of them doing it. What is your benefit from pace? You supply the inputs, you supply the you know, machinery, you do everything. And then out of them there's an agreement that the company gets. 25% or get 40%. I, mean, I think things like that can go. But you must first recognize that. Uh, but historically, such relations have tended to be exploited and benefit capital. 
yeah, I agree with you. I'm, I'm saying I, I was putting it to say the worst case scenario mm -hmm. where you go by the model number one, the first the, uh, area, would be if they want to fit in, they let them fit there. If they have to do any arrangement, it has to be with the people on the ground. But I certainly agree that right from the start, we work with the people there. It should be their choice whether they decide to bring in a private person to help them. But most, 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 most uh, governments are arguing that Africa actually needs this investment. Whilst this sounds very good, maybe theoretically, but where, where will the money be coming from? If there is no money to invest, that's why we want foreign investment. It, it's yours. Uh, well, I, I think that uh, it's not a very honest uh, way of putting things across. I think when it comes to development of land and, and issues around that, it's no longer correct that Africa at this stage needs uh, the kind of foreign investment which will lead to displacement. Clearly not. I have not seen any of these investors as far as area like you want to uh, the processing area, let's say the people will produce, then you want to do fuel well and so on. And that's a different thing. And why would you, I don't know even why they give this investor the, all that thing to start from the planting and the, and so on, all the way to the producing the, the, the fuel. And why should they, why would the investor not start there and these people are supplying to them? And these are things that uh, I think are not being worked out, yeah. So I don't agree that the, there is an area where they would say that they need the much needed investment. Uh, it appears also to be political games, which will go back to the voters themselves. The only solution would be if voters are going to be a bit clear. I mean, they still vote for leaders who claim that they brought investment, even though they have not seen uh, that investment. I mean, I've seen that uh, happening. I mean, if you see that uh, ED's campaigns uh, for 2023, they are focusing on uh, his brought investment, his done this. But he would need no less than two million uh, votes, substantial votes, no less than that to be able to win. Out of that uh, two million votes, I don't think 300,000, not more than 300,000 would have been people that would have benefited in any way from his leadership. And that's, uh, that's, that's where the problem is. Yeah. But uh, we have seen it uh, in Zambia that these communities can also adapt these kinds of investment. Yes, I think that that is the way to go. We, we need to get to cogitize our communities to be able to ensure that people understand that. I don't think, uh, I got, I'm just looking at, um, I, my generation which didn't go to the liberation struggle, but I think that the, our generation then did not engage in this approach by by citizens in dealing with this, where they have better chances of winning against uh, the state capital pollution. Revolutionary approach, uh, the legal approach, or negotiating? I think obviously it's the revolutionary, what you're calling the revolutionary approach, whatever that would entail. I think it entails... You are the one who said Yeah, okay, that's fine. So I, 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 that's when, for you, I thought whatever I meant, but for me, it simply means that the communal people and everyone must just take a radical approach where they say that land is theirs. And then because it's theirs, anything to do with the development of that or any change has to be with them as ag agreeing or not. I mean, how do you target the communal land and you're not targeting other land? And so, I mean, let me give an example. Let's say you think that uh, people in Mbari, they are now overcrowded and so on, and you want to remove them. Uh, and so you want to destroy the entire area in Bari around Stoddard Hall, for example, for good reasons. You don't even think about that. No one would have the political authority to do that. So I think they should take that, I call, if you, we're calling the revolution or radical approach. It must start by asserting the rights of communal people and then define certain non-negotiable areas. Then you move on to development. That's how I would, uh, I would, I would look at it. I prefer that the best. The negotiation approach only works if the people accept that you have a right 
But from the current things, people are negotiating from a position of weakness where the government says, well, either you agree with us, we can take a few concessions, but if we don't agree, we'll move our, our head and do it. I think that would not be the way to go. For these and other stories, visit our website, www.263chat.com. Follow us on Twitter, at 263chat, and like our Facebook page, 263chat.